And uh, Dr. Fatih Birol, the Executive Director of the uh, International uh, Energy Agency, will talk to you about energy. And with no further ado, I give the floor to the President. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. And I'm very happy to welcome here Fatih Birol. Indeed, we had a very good discussion on an energy outlook on, uh, for Europe and how to deal with the unprecedented disruptions that are have been caused by Russia's atrocious war. Russia indeed has cut its pipeline supplies by 80% if you compare September this year um, to September last year, 80%. And we all know that these pipeline gas cuts have added unprecedented pressure on the global energy markets with severe knock-on effects on Europe's energy system. But I want to emphasize that um, despite these enormous cuts, we have been able to manage, we've been able to withstand the blackmail, we've acted, and we've acted successfully. Seven months ago in May, we have presented our response to this Russian blackmail by putting on the table Repower EU, our plan to reduce the demand for Russian gas, by two-thirds before the end of this year. And we have underpinned this proposal with uh, an investment plan of up to 300 billion euros. And in just a few months, we have turned the Repower EU plan into many different legislative proposals and actions on the ground. And I think it's worth to look at that. Basically, we have taken in the last 10 months 10 different actions. The first one is we have um, enormously diversified away from Russian fossil fuels, away from Russian gas supplies, towards other reliable, trustworthy suppliers. Second, we are saving energy. We have introduced, as you all know, the target to reduce gas demand by 15%. And if we look at the data from early autumn, we are very well on track. It's good that we are saving energy, and we have keep on saving energy. The third point is we are boosting the rollout of renewables. If you look at the year 2022, we will have added almost 50 gigawatt of new capacity, capacity that is almost doubling the, capacity, the uh, additional capacity of renewable energy, mostly from wind and solar. And um, this is for us very important because this is not only good for the planet, but we know that renewables are homegrown, they create good jobs here, and they create independence and security of supply. The fourth point is that in this context of renewables, we have proposed to speed up drastically the permitting process for renewables. We know that many projects are basically ready to go, if the permitting was there, so this has to be faster. Therefore, we have put a proposal on speeding up the permitting process on the table. The fifth point is that we have put in place a minimum gas storage obligation. Our storages are now filled by more than 90%, so we have overshooted the target, that's very good, and we're well above the previous five-year average. The sixth point is on solidarity. We have proposed default arrangements for the supply of gas between member states, where solidarity agreements are not in place yet, to make sure in an energy emergency, we can ensure that the gas is going and flowing where to it is needed most. The seventh point is we have set up a platform for the joint purchasing of gas to increase our negotiation leverage and get better prices. I think it's unacceptable that different member states are outbidding each other on the global market and thus driving up the prices. Therefore, it is important that we join forces for the negotiation on a global level. The eighth point is we have improved our infrastructure. We have four new interconnectors that, are, uh, that became operational this year. It's the Baltic Pipe. It's the interconnector Poland-Lithuania the interconnector between Bulgaria and Greece, and the gas interconnector between Poland and Slovakia. The ninth point I want to highlight is the fact that we have 
put out a legal framework that enables member states to skim off the windfall profits, the super profits of energy producing companies, to take this money and to support by that in a targeted manner the vulnerable households and the vulnerable businesses. And finally, the tenth point is we proposed a market correction mechanism, known also as the price cap, to limit spikes in gas prices at TTF level. Many of these measures have been adopted, some in record speed, and there are many examples that show that change is beginning. For example, the massive and rapid uptake of heat pumps in Poland. The result of all these actions is that we are safe for this winter. Russia's blackmail has failed. However, some of our proposals are still under discussion and they are essential for our energy preparedness. Therefore, I call on the Council to adopt them swiftly because preparing for the next winter, winter 23-24, starts now. And this is now that we're turning our focus on the winter 23-24. I'm very pleased, dear Fatih Birol, that we've worked on that so intensively together. One month ago, your message was very clear, and you underpinned your message with figures and numbers. You said very clearly the coming winter will be even more challenging, and Europe needs to step up its efforts in several fields. You outlined the risks. It may, might be possible that Russia cuts the rest of the um, pipeline gas supply. China could lift the COVID restriction and thus go back to energy demand on the global market on pre-COVID level. And of course, this year we benefit from an extraordinary warm winter. This also could be different next year. I know from your data that despite the action that we have taken, we might still face a gap of up to 30 billion cubic meter of gas next year. The actions that we have set in motion will help cover part of this, but more is needed. And here I want to look at a few priorities we need to focus on. The first one is, of course, the LNG supply. I'm confident that we will secure similar volumes of LNG next year as we had this year. This year we had up to 130 billion cubic meter of LNG. And for this, of course, we have to further intensify our outreach to our international partners. My second point is, it is time now that we make joint purchasing a reality. We have the energy platform in place. We have to oper operationalize it now in the joint purchasing mechanism, every day of delay comes with a price tag. We have discussions with member states, partner countries and their companies that are ongoing. This evening, tonight, I will discuss this matter with the Norwegian Prime Minister, for example. We can launch the first tender for demand aggregation by the end of March, but for that, we need to have an agreement on the emergency regulation we proposed on the 18th of October, and we need it now. And my final point is that the greatest potential for energy in the European Union is, on our, uh, is in our own hands. We must scale up and accelerate the deployment of renewables. We must go big and we must be fast. With the right policies in place, we can even double the capacity of renewable energy that we add to the market next year. And the case has never been better. In 22, we had record additions of wind and solar capacity to the European Union, in the European Union. And we expect renewable capacity to rise even further in the coming year replacing around 12 billion cubic meter of gas. And you are showing us with your additional measures that we can add an additional 7.5 billion cubic meters. So if you look at the overall scope, efficiency, savings, joint purchasing, renewables, this might be the mixture we need to make up for the missing gas next year. We've taken the action that is necessary. Our proposals are now on the table. My last comment is on the bigger picture. 
Because if we look at the bigger picture, we also see that we need an increase in public investment in the energy transition, mostly to ensure the competitiveness of our European industry in the energy transition. We need additional public investment on a national level and on a European level. You know that in the short term, we will propose to boost Repower EU. Repower EU is our vehicle, the framework for investment in clean tech. We, propose to, we will propose to boost it. And this is one part of our response to the US Inflation Reduction Act. But we also know that in the midterm we have to step up. And there we will work on setting up a sovereignty fund to make sure that Europe continues to be the global leader in clean tech. Where we have to help our industry is now in this high energy price environment to make the transition, to bridge the transition to green, clean energy that is affordable and secure, and therefore this funding is necessary. Our work has been um, good this year. We see the progress. We have come quite a long way, but we know that we are not done with our work till families and business in the European Union have access to energy that is affordable, that is secure, and that is clean. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, President. Dr. Birol. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Madam President, it's a great honor uh, for me and for my agency to share this uh, stage with you today. Thank you very much, uh, Madam. Uh, dear colleagues, we are in the middle of the first truly global energy crisis. Our world has never ever witnessed an energy crisis of this depth and of this complexity. All the countries around the world are affected with this energy crisis, but of course, Ukraine is the main victim. As I mentioned to uh, Madam President a few minutes ago, uh, this afternoon, I am going to uh, meet Ukrainian Energy Minister Galushenko to sign a joint work program for the next two years. First, to support Ukrainian energy system for the next uh, months to come. And second, assist uh, Ukraine to build a modern energy system after the war. But of course, uh, Europe is uh, heavily affected uh, from uh, the energy crisis as uh, Russia was a key supplier of energy for Europe since uh, decades. And I, uh, I want to comment the focus that the Madam President and her commissioners have brought uh, to this uh, issue. Now, uh, International Energy Agency has responded to the, uh, this crisis uh, very quickly in our nimble way. 24th of February was the invasion. 1st of March, only one week later, we came up with a 10-point plan for Europe, what European countries can do in order to reduce the reliance on uh, Russian gas and what measures need to be taken, ranging from efficiency to renewables, penetration, acceleration of those, and to the topics which are hot topics in Europe, such as a, a postponing of phasing out of a nuclear power in some countries. And they were very much aligned with the Republic EU, came from the uh, Commission, and uh, we are very happy that uh, many governments uh, in Europe have taken up our uh, suggestions. Now, uh, as uh, Madam President uh, mentioned, uh, Europe has done a lot to increase the resilience of the European energy system in the last uh, several uh, months. Uh, and today, we are, this winter, it looks like we are off the hook. We may go through this winter with some economic and social bruises, but normally we should go through this winter as a result of all the measures taken uh, in Europe because our gas torches are uh, very uh, high. But the message that I am bringing uh, up to you today is that the crisis is not over. And next year may well be, 2023, may well be 
much more difficult than this year, for three reasons. First, in the year 2021, Russian gas exports to Europe was about 140 BCM. This year, it went down to 60 BCM as a, a, a 2022, and it is uh, very likely that next year we may not have any Russian gas in our system. So there was a decline, and uh, as we all know, Russia is using uh, the uh, gas as a, a, a weapon when it comes to certain political issues. So next year, the first reason why we are thinking next year may be more difficult first Russian gas, which is declining already substantially, may not be with us at all. Second, uh, LNG. As Madam President mentioned, we, this year uh, we import a lot of LNG from US and other sources, but next year might be even more difficult. The reason is the amount of new LNG capacity, LNG supply, LNG uh, coming from the exporting countries is at record low, only 20 BCM. We have recently never ever seen such a small amount of additional capacity coming. Uh, in Europe, uh, we have now, we are building many countries LNG import capacity. It's about 40 BCM coming next year, but the new LNG coming to market is very, very limited. And on top of that, China, a top LNG importer of the world, as a result of a possible comeback to economy, China may already eat up a big portion of that. So LNG markets will be tight. This is the second reason. Third reason why we are worried about the next year is uh, that the, uh, this year we have uh, experienced uh, unusually mild temperatures. And when you look at it today and the next days, the temperature in, in, in Europe, we may uh, well see that the next weeks will be uh, rather uh, difficult in terms of the temperature and also uh, nobody can guarantee that next year's temperature will be as mild as this year. So putting these three things uh, together, namely there may not be a, a Russian gas deliveries at all, LNG markets will be exceptionally tight and third that we may not be able to benefit from the mild temperature uh, means that we may have a problem. So therefore, we made this uh, report that uh, I have the honor to uh, launch today with the, uh, Madam uh, President. Uh, we think that next year, Europe supply demand gap 2023 may reach the 30 BCM. It's a big number, 30 BCM, the gap. And if those efforts you mentioned, uh, uh, Madam President, uh, you have uh, done uh, with your uh, uh, colleagues were not there, this gap would have been uh, 60 BCM. As a result of these efforts, we have brought down uh, to uh, 30 BCM. This is a serious uh, uh, challenge, and uh, therefore uh, we thought, what can Europe do between now and next uh, uh, winter in order to close this gap what kind of measures, and which are in line with the Europe's climate goals. So we can do many things, but we have chosen the measures which are uh, practical, can be done in one year, very short time for energy sector, one year, and at the same time in line with Europe, Europe's uh, climate goals. We have chosen five uh, topics, and I will finish uh, with that. The first one is faster improvement in energy efficiency, especially renovation of uh, uh, buildings, focusing on the, uh, on the uh, social housing uh, first and providing incentive for renovation of the buildings. Or another example we have, uh, many countries in Europe don't have in their street lighting, LED lighting, move to LED lighting, incentivize them, and save uh, energy there. So the first one is energy efficiency. We have a lot of uh, suggestions and examples, but I have chose this two. Second, faster deployment of uh, renewables. As Madam President said, this year we have seen a major 
record uh, deployment of renewables. The reason is, in the past, the main driver for renewables in Europe was climate change, and now energy security is the main driver of uh, renewables. We have seen major improvement there, and still there is a long project pipeline, and they are waiting for licensing and permitting. And uh, it is, uh, in our view, uh, imperative that the countries are shortening uh, uh, this uh, licensing and permitting time. And it's, it is done in some uh, countries that the uh, governments show uh, the suitable uh, areas for larger uh, projects. And the authorization process, it takes ages in some uh, countries, should be done in a one-go uh, one shops uh, 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 one stop uh, go uh, sh uh, uh, shops in uh, many countries. The third one is uh, the uh, uh, heat pumps. One third of the European gas is consumed in for heating in the buildings. And going from the gas heating to electricity heating, uh, we have uh, only the available proven technology, heat pumps, and there is a need for further incentivizing the heat pumps. Uh, uh, changing the electricity tariffs to provide a, a additional incentive for heat pumps. This will also save, uh, again, uh, gas. And fourth, the uh, changing the behavior of the consumers. Well-designed uh, communication uh, campaigns would be helpful uh, here. Again, ac according to our analysis in uh, Europe today, the average temperature in the buildings are about 22 degrees Celsius, bringing it done one degree Celsius would save us about 10 BCM, so significant uh, amount. And the fifth and the last uh, 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 measure that we are suggesting is in some of the uh, countries that are exporting gas to Europe, especially the countries in like Algeria, Egypt, a lot of gas is uh, uh, flaring just uh, through methane, it is flaring. If they are captured, which is very easy and cheap, and if there's an incentive there, that gas can be uh, just uh, sent to uh, Europe in the context of, uh, we say them, you capture, we pay for it. It can provide the additional gas uh, to Europe. These measures uh, are uh, already documented in our report. You will see easily done, practical and real world impact measures, and they would cost they wouldn't be for free, they would cost 100 billion euros in one year. So we have to pay 100 billion euros to, in, in order to implement them, but that 100 billion euros will be paid back in two years in terms of saving natural gas bills. So this is a, in two years they pay back this 100 billion uh, dollar of uh, investments and they will bring multiple uh, benefits to, uh, to weaken the pressure on the households and the, uh, and the uh, businesses. This is uh, perhaps a, a very important one. Second, uh, they are going to accelerate the clean energy transition. Third, they will comfort the uh, international uh, markets. And fourth, uh, they will provide a firm answer to Russia weaponizing uh, uh, energy. So uh, I would like to uh, uh, stop uh, here, and uh, the, there are some proposals uh, we are following at the IEA, as uh, Madam uh, President uh, mentioned. We very much hope that uh, those uh, proposals, uh, Madam President, see the light of the day as soon as possible, because we need an urgent decision, and it is never too early to address the problems of uh, next uh, winter. Uh, we are thankful to you for your uh, leadership and uh, we are uh, happy to work with the European Commission and uh, with the member states, and we are at your disposal. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. I will now take a few questions. There were many requests already. Please note that there is a technical briefing following this press conference, so you may save your more technical questions for our experts from the European Commission and from the agency. And let's start from right, Karl. Um, 
Good afternoon, Carl de Meyer for the French Daily Les Echo. Um, good afternoon, Mrs. Uh, President. I have three questions for you, if I may. Um, I was very interested um, uh, when you mentioned the uh, sovereignty, the, the sovereignty fund. Sorry, um, can you please give us more details on what it could look like and what do you hear from the member states about it? Do you sense an appetite for it? And do you think it is time for the uh, EU to have a new common borrowing um, instrument? And um, then I would like to ask you about nuclear fusion. Uh, we hear from the United States that there has been groundbreaking progress about uh, this technology. Is it something that the uh, EU is uh, looking uh, at? And tonight you have a very interesting uh, dinner in, uh, in, in, in Paris. What do you expect from your uh, talks with the Norwegians? Yeah. Um, so the sovereignty fund, first of all, uh, again, for the short term, we have Repower EU, which we have to boost. Repower EU defines the, the investment targets and elements. It's mainly the clean tech sector, it's energy efficiency, it's uh, infrastructure that is needed, and it's renewables. And here we propose to boost um, Repower EU but we will certainly also have to approach a midterm review of our budget because our budget has been decided at a time where we had no clue of all the crisis coming up. Um, therefore, the question is whether it is still fit for purpose. Um, and a fresh look through a midterm review at the budget would open the door to create a sovereignty fund that certainly would not only be fed by existing uh, European uh, funds that we have already in place, but would have then also to uh, be augmented by other sources. But this is for the midterm if we look at that. The fusion, indeed, we look at a lot of interest uh, at the breakthrough that is being reported on the nuclear fusion. This breakthrough is based on a different technology pathway than ITER. So it demonstrates that the case to continue investing in nuclear fusion is strong. And this, of course, includes through ITER um, the, the, the topic of ITER, because ITER is, for example, involving also the United States as an integral partner. So we need various approaches to securing this clean energy in the future, but uh, it is very interesting and it shows that it is worthwhile to intensify the work and the research on fusion. Finally, Norway. Indeed, our teams have been working intensively um, on this issue, and I'm very much looking forward to speak with the Norwegian Prime Minister today. On one hand, to take stock of the progress, and on the other hand, also to move forward. You might recall that we had a joint statement in October, and uh, there we um, emphasize that we fully share uh, our, on one hand, the concerns about the current level of high energy prices, that we agree politically and economically they are unsustainable, and in that statement we together expressed our determination that prices should be significantly reduced. What we have to do is to work on a balance between the short-term price reduction and longer-term cooperation, um, so we could, for example, look into the option of uh, longer-term contracts. But I would also um, highly appreciate if there's a possibility to have Norwegian energy supply companies joining our joint purchase platform, so to go also in that topic. And last but not least, um, we uh, both agree, the Norwegian Prime Minister and me, that was also part of our statement, that a massive investment in clean energy production has to be done with uh, this amount of money um, that is coming additionally uh, to the energy producing companies. I want to recall that Norway sent an additional, additional 9 billion cubic meter of gas to Europe this year. This is a lot. And it is important that these efforts, I know that they are really pushing their efforts to the maximum, that these maximum efforts uh, are being sustained. Thank you very much. Irini, next. 
Thank you, Dana. Irene Zakadula with Greek Public TV and Athens in the Agency. Madam President, the negotiations on price cap are ongoing. However, the European uh, citizens are wondering why is it impossible to reach an agreement faster um, that could lower their bills? And when should we expect to have an agreement on this correction mechanism? Thank you. Yeah, we all know that for the market correction mechanism, um, the issue is to find the right balance that we cut off the price spikes and manipulation and speculation, and on the other hand, that we do not cut off supply coming to the European market. Here we have to find the right balance. The proposal is on the table. A lot of work has been done. Um, the technicalities are set. So what we need now is a political agreement on what kind of price cap uh, where the balance is of what kind of price cap we want. So political agreement on the scope, on the threshold, and the threshold includes that we have, that we are aware that we have to include the risk of demand reduction, that we have to include the security of supply and the stability, the financial stability. Those three items have to be included in the political decision on scope and threshold. I very much hope that we will come to a conclusion within the next days. Thank you. Next one will be Alice. Yeah, well, get another mic then. Yeah, it works. Thank you, sorry, Alice Financial Times. Thank you, Madam President, for taking my question. Um, I had two, one is related to energy. Um, I wanted to ask, um, we're aware that there's a huge effort to wean off Russian hydrocarbons, but there has also been a huge jump in imports of Russian liquefied natural gas. At the same time, what plans, if any, does the Commission have to reduce reliance on uh, Russian LNG? And an un-energy related one, uh, following the probe into Qatari influence in the European Parliament we saw over the weekend, I wondered if you could tell us um, whether the Commission will now pursue your proposal from 2019 to set up an ethics body, and if you could update us on that pledge. Yeah. Um, indeed, partially, Russia tries partially to circumvent by increasing LNG supply to the European market. That's not easy to trace. But what we know is as overall the LNG supply has increased, the share of the Russian LNG has decreased. So um, it is a mixed story, and we have to look deeper into it and look into possibilities uh, to make sure that we have LNG from reliable suppliers. But as I said, it's not easy to trace. I, I don't know whether it's of interest for you to comment on that too. No, this is uh, the, uh, the LNG imports from Russia increase, but from a very, very low uh, levels. The main issue is the pipelines, and the, uh, from the pipelines, we are seeing a major uh, decline, uh, f as I mentioned, from 140 BCM uh, to 60 BCM. But the LNG import increase, it seems high in terms of percentage, but from uh, in terms of uh, the uh, the absolute value is about 5, 6 BCM, which is really uh, uh, peanuts. Yes, and um, to your uh, second question, indeed, the allegations against the Vice President of the European Parliament uh, are of utmost concern, very serious. It is a question of confidence of people into our institutions, and um, this confidence and trust into our institutions needs highest standards and of independence and integrity. And you're right, I propose the creation of an independent ethics body that covers all EU institutions and to be established with the highest standards for all institutions. It is important, I wrote this letter, um, not only to Council and the European Parliament, but for example, also to the European Court of Justice, the ECB, uh, the European Court of Auditors, I'm speaking about all institutions. I sent this letter in March. Um, the Vice President Jourova is um, currently discussing with the European Parliament and the Council the way forward. For us, it is very critical to have not only strong rules, but the same rules also covering all the European institutions and not to allow for any kind of exemptions. 
So it's a matter of transparency, it's a matter of very clear rules, and all the European institutions should abide to the same rules that we put in place. Thank you very much. I will now go online where we have a few hands up. Eva, go ahead. Yes, hello, Eva Krukowska at Bloomberg so News. Could turn on your camera. Yes, that's great. Thank you. Thank you. Madam President, a quick question on joint purchases. The idea has been around for a while, but uh, no big interest has been seen from member states or companies. What are you planning to do in order to encourage them to practically implement that? And to Dr. Birol, first of all, does the 30 BCM uh, supply demand gap assume no Russian gas? And my second question would be, how do you think the EU proposed gas price cap could help or not help the market? Thank you. So indeed, uh, with the joint purchase platform, we've established it and we have a um, political agreement on it. It's a voluntary participation. Um, but what we've seen um, over the last weeks is that the interest is drastically increasing in this joint platform because by now almost everybody sees that it is important that we join forces and have this, thus the leverage uh, of our joint forces on the global market. So what we need now is we have put a legal proposal on the table and we hope and expect that the Council will agree on this legal proposal within the next days. In terms of the 30 BCM, 30 BCM uh, assumes, first of all, no Russian uh, gas exports to Europe and at the same time temperatures go back to the normal seasonal, uh, seasonal levels and a limited amount of uh, LNG. So as a result, we come to 30 BCM. As I mentioned, if those measures in Europe have not been taken this year, this would have been a 60 BCM, but 30 BCM alone is a major issue because if we are not, allow, if we are not able to address this 30 BCM, at the end of the next winter season, 90% of our storage levels today will go to 30% uh, only, this is one. In terms of the uh, gas price uh, mechanism, uh, the uh, gas price cap mechanism, I think uh, this is a good correction mechanism if it is uh, well designed to protect the uh, consumers because even though the gas prices are today going coming down, they are still seven times higher than uh, the, 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 uh, the historical averages. And here, uh, well designed meaning it shouldn't uh, give uh, Europe uh, the, uh, the role that it can get gas from the other markets, outcompete many others, but at the same time protect the consumers here. The level of the uh, price uh, will be here. Uh, very important, but in general, it's a good way to go with the right uh, price uh, level. Thank you, Dana. Madam 